Wow. Welcome, everybody, after the lunch break. It's a great honor for me to, to speak to you. And before lunch, we did an exercise. So maybe after lunch, we also start with centering ourselves that the talks we had are finished. We are back in the room focusing on, on work. And if you want, you can just feel your feet on the ground, feel the seat behind you, how it supports you. And you can take a deep breath just to see how you are. Right. My name is Lubos Tibensky. As, as already said, I'm working for the regional office of SS Children's Villages International. So, as already mentioned here, SS Children's Villages works in over 130 countries and territories around the world. And uh, we are organized in, in regional offices to support uh, countries that are geographically close together. Um, and the region that I work with is uh, consisting of countries of uh, Central and Eastern Europe, um, Middle East, and Central Asia. And Latvia is one of those countries. And I'm really um, congratulating you to your 21st, 5th anniversary from the bottom of my heart. Uh, it's always a pleasure to work together with the Latvian team. And you contribute a lot to our regional meetings. And I, it's a pleasure now to be here and contribute to your conference. So working in the region, um, I'm here not only talking as, as your colleague, I'm a psychologist, I was working in alternative care and counseling of families at risk. Uh, I was working also as, an, as a pedagogue, as an educator in a small group home with eight children living in it. So I'm, I'm talking as a colleague, but also I'm bringing in experience from um, other countries in our region and from all the colleagues that I had the uh, chance to meet and exchange with. I'm here to talk about um, trauma-informed practice. It was mentioned here today um, that the situation uh, in Latvia is very similar to other countries around the world. Um, it was very um, moving to hear that we are focusing on deinstitutionalization, on uh, working with foster families, um, supporting children in becoming independent and living care. And you also mentioned some of the challenges, uh, keeping our colleagues that directly work with children motivated, prevent their burnout, um, supporting children that have mental health conditions or that have been through um, adverse situations in their lives. And this is something that you have in common with other countries that are also finding solutions for these uh, issues. We see in our region that as the deinstitutionalization progresses, uh, we have better support uh, offers for families at risk. So we prevent children to go to alternative care. But on the other hand, for alternative care, it means that more and more children with severe experiences of abuse and neglect come to alternative care. So, the target group we are working with is changing over time. And we were trying to find um, concepts and uh, approaches that would help us um, to support children that we work with in the best possible way. And one of those is the trauma-informed practice. So I would like to share a little bit more about this approach. 
and I will do it in a way that I will share the, the background, the, um, the theory on the, con on the context, uh, concept, but at the same time, I would like to introduce a project that we did in, um, in SS Children's Villages. It was a project called Safe Places Thriving Children. The aim of the project was to embed trauma-informed practices into alternative care settings. And you see that uh, we have six countries that took part in the project. And uh, the project was steered by the International Office of SOS Children's Villages. And it was supported by the Center for Excellence for Children's Care and Protection uh, of Strathclyde University in Scotland. It was a very big project <laughs> going over two years. And it was funded, co-funded by um, the European Commission. So. I would like to start with a reflection uh, on how are different people facing safety and adversity in their lives. So first of all, I would like to ask you to choose one of these symbols randomly, which one makes sense to you at the moment. So choose either the cross, the circle, the triangle, uh, or, or the square. And if you have it, then each of them represents a specific person that you will try to put yourself in the shoes of this person for this reflection exercise. So can you just raise hand who chose the, the cross? Few of them. OK, few crosses. Very good. So you are going to do the exercise from the point of an eight-year-old child that is living in alternative care. So we'll try to think about how, how this person um, is. The ones that have the circle, how? OK, oh, many circles. And the circle will be a, a 10-year-old child living in a safe family environment. OK. Triangles. Good. And the triangles, it's a 15-year-old uh, gay Roma teenager. So you'll think about from their perspective. And uh, square. <laughs> just few, just few squares. And the square, you will be thinking as if you are a 41-year-old professional who works in alternative care. So, and now what do I want you to do? You will raise your hand, and you'll have five fingers open, right? And I will read statements. For each statement that is true for your person, you will put one finger down. If this statement doesn't apply for the person, you will lift the finger up, right? Good. So let's go. Is the person feeling safe when they go to bed? If yes, one finger down. If not, keep the finger up. Um, does this person have a person to support them? If yes, one, one finger down. Can this person buy whatever they want or ask for whatever they want? Does this person, this person doesn't have to worry about the next day? If yes, put one finger down. And does this person have a warm meal prepared for them? Good. So remember how many fingers you have left? OK. So and let's have a look. So the, the cross is how many fingers? Three, four, OK, four. So quite many answers were not answered as safe. OK. What about 
the circles. Ah, all fingers gone, one finger left. So much more safer, the children that are living in safe environment. What about the triangle, the 15-year-old Roma martinager? Two fingers, three fingers, five fingers left, okay. And the square, the professional. Now I have to look really, how many? Oh, all gone, all gone, okay. Good. So what was the aim of this exercise? I want to say that this exercise was developed by young people that have care experience. And this is how they see the world. And this is how they wanted to share with us that children that live in alternative care don't have many things for granted. And even when we do everything we can, and we are satisfied with the service we provide, it doesn't mean they have to feel safe. But, but also, it shows that um, there are also other people that are maybe living in their families and their communities, but because of um, their specific situation, they also might not be safe, as we saw with the um, Roma teenager. So, where do I am? Where, where, where am I going with this? Um, I want to talk about trauma and um, difficult life experiences and how they influence mental health and development of children and young people. So, in general, we tend to misunderstand the term mental health. We think you are either healthy or you have a diagnosis. But it's not like these two categories. Mental health is a continuum. And it's built by protective factors, by our resources, but also by risk factors. And the risk factors can be based on biology that we inherit or based on our life. If we, are based, uh, if we are born premature or if we are born on time, if we um, go through specific illnesses, but also they are, it's influenced by the protective or risk factors of our, our environment, especially our caregivers, our family. And mental health, it's not only about being healthy or ill, Mental health is a foundation um, that builds our future. So when we talk that in our programs, in our services, we want to have, we have the aim of young people being independent, being able to live their lives fully and having their own children and raising them well. Well, for that they need mental health. And I think we, we heard it from, from Yvonne from the presentation, that mental health is a part of the areas we have to address when working with young people. Why mental health and trauma? Why is that so important for our target group? First of all, if you look at adverse childhood experiences, like abuse, neglect, separation of parents, one parent or both parents using substances or being in prison. All of these situations are having an impact on our mental health, but also on our physical health. And from the statistics, we know that even like we are sitting here, we don't have to have an experience of being separated from our parents and being in alternative care almost half of us would have at least one or more adverse experiences in our lives. So we need to be aware of that. At the same time, we know that even having an adverse experience, even a traumatic experience, it doesn't mean that our development has to be impaired. 
we can develop, we can overcome trauma and thrive. And the most protective factor is having loving parents, loving environment that is helping us to overcome the adversity. We have some laughter here. I, I'm curious about the translators, the interpreters, how they are doing. <laughs> Good. So, when we look at alternative care, imagine what is the reason for young people coming to alternative care. It's neglect, it's abuse, it's some dysfunction or some difficulties faced by their biological families. So implicitly, we have adverse childhood experiences as a reason to come into alternative care. Based on how you define adverse childhood experiences, the research showed different percentages. But when I was talking to young people that experience alternative care, they said, well, we all have been through adverse childhood experiences. Separating from parents, from families, nevertheless, what kind of family um, it is. It's always an adversity. So when we know this, we have to find ways how to understand what does adversity and trauma do to children in alternative care and how we can support them. And of course, we need to support children in families so that they don't come to alternative care. And we heard how in Latvia and in SOS Children's Villages Latvia this is done. But today I want to focus on children in alternative care. So, one of the things we have to be aware of is that the understanding of trauma might be very different from country to country <laughs> and also from uh, professional to professional or to a, from a person to a person. Very often we think of trauma as something that is an answer to a huge drama, a huge adversity like a car crash or being in a disaster. And then you have very clear symptoms that we normally describe as post-traumatic stress disorder. But unfortunately, with this diagnosis, it's a diagnosis that is described for adults. So looking for the same symptoms in children might be quite difficult. And at the same time, the children that come to alternative care they have a different experience. They don't experience car crashes, well maybe they do, but mostly they experience neglectful parenting, risky situations or abusive situations that are prolonged. That doesn't happen one time and there is a beginning and an end to it. If you live in a family with domestic violence, it means you are confronted with violence every day. So what, what we heard in the previous presentation, Caspers uh, described how this facing adversity and stress every day, in everyday situations, every day, how this influences the brain and the development of a child. Because it's a prolonged situation of abuse or neglect or adversity that continues. And it happens while the child is growing up. So it will influence the child differently compared to influencing an adult that is already formed and has a lot of resources. So, we saw in his presentation that the brain is focusing its attention on protecting the person from stress and adversity. And one diagnosis or one way how to describe it is the concept of complex trauma. 
By complex trauma, we mean a trauma that happens between people. So it's not a disaster coming from outside. It's actually something that happens and it's done by a parent, a sibling, or a teacher. So it has a very different quality because it kind of influences our trust in people, especially if it's coming from our family members, it's influencing our trust in all adults in the world. It's a traumatic situation, so it involves some feeling of being helpless, not able to change the situation. Just imagine a child in a family. Very often the child doesn't have the power and uh, you know, the status in the family to change things. And if it goes on for a long time, it is ongoing, it has a cumulative effect. So the effect piles upon each other by each experience. And it affects the way how children feel. There is lots of involvement of shame, uh, mistrust, and if a child is abuses, abused or neglected, there is a message to the child from the adults in this behavior saying, you are not worth of my love or attention. So based on that, the children internalize this feeling of low self-esteem. There are really, really strong emotions coming towards the child of fear, uh, of anger, and the child is not prepared to deal with it. To be able to cope with emotions, children need adults to help them regulate and control the emotions. So the children will have impacted, the, like the, the trauma will impact the way children cope with emotions. And children will develop some strategies to make themselves safer, to survive. And we heard also that in the presentations before, that sometimes the strategy that is helping them is just not trusting the adults, just being there for themselves and taking care of themselves and not asking for help or support. So if they come with this strategy to alternative care, we need to address that because just to be there and being open to them doesn't mean that we can change their trust in adults. We have to do an extra step and invest a bit more. Another strategy might be being withdrawn, not wanting to go in, in relationships, but it can be also to be confrontative, to be defending themselves and to better fight than wait to be uh, hurt. And we see that in children quite a lot as well. And the question is, are we going to challenge it? Are we going to discipline it? Or are we going to accept it as a part of dealing with difficult emotions? Right. And there is research showing that experiencing trauma influences the child's development, their emotional, mental, but also physical health in childhood, but also in adulthood. And if the trauma or mental health condition is not treated, there is a high chance that um, it will have impact on the life of the child in the future. When they are adult, either they, they might face problems finding work, uh, adapting, um, they can have mental health problems or abuse drugs. So, when we say we want a better future for children we work with, then we are saying we want to help them to have the best possible mental health they can. When, coming back to the project, when it started, we, before we started to, to develop some methodology and training and approaches, 
We wanted to hear from professionals and from young people that experienced care. What are their problems? How, do, how safe do they feel in their work or in their care placement? And what we found in this scoping exercise, in this little qualitative research in the beginning, it was confirming what I just said. So the children were saying, or the young people that grow grown up, they say, we are extra vulnerable. We are the same as any other child you meet on the street. But on top of that, we have our history and our backpack on, the, on our backs. So we are extra vulnerable in a sense. And they say that they would love to address this difficulty or this adversity that they faced, but their caregivers in alternative care seem not to be prepared for it. So this echoes what the social workers and educators told us. They were not trained to deal with trauma. They were not trained to address difficult feelings. And that's why also if we, are, if we don't know what to do and we face emotions that are very high for us, well, we protect ourselves by not talking about it, not addressing it. So we have to look, are the studies, the education for social workers, SS parents, foster parents, do they address the impact of trauma and adversity on children? And especially, do they prepare these professionals to, to address them, to, to respond to child's feelings and to stories what the children bring? I was also trained as a psychologist and as, as a psychotherapist. Complex trauma was not mentioned. We were always talking about PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. We were always talking about adults. But as I just demonstrated, children have their own specifics, how they react to adversity. So this was the aim of the project to address that. So the way we wanted to address it is to use trauma-informed practice. What is it? Trauma-informed practice is a fairly new uh, discipline. It is very much present in the English-speaking countries, in United Kingdom, in United States. But also, it starts to be addressed also in, in, uh, in our region, in our countries. Um, there are three elements that make trauma-informed practice. First, we have to acknowledge that trauma is in the lives of everybody, like everybody here. You would have some experience yourself, or your close people would have some experience with adversity. For us, working in alternative care, it means acknowledging that the children that we work with have even higher possibility or risk that they've been through traumatic events. And we have to understand what are the paths for healing? What do people that experience trauma, traumatic events, what do they need to cope to develop. If we want to work with children that experience trauma, we have to acknowledge what does it mean for us as professionals. Because as I said, all of us had some contact with adversity ourselves. So working with children with trauma, it will trigger, it will also make our feelings about trauma and our concepts alive. So we need to know that also we as professionals, also foster parents, also SOS parents or teachers, we all have a reaction to seeing a child that is hurting 
or a child that is having some strong feeling of anger or anxiety. And we need to be ready to address that. We need to know that working with children that experience trauma will affect also the whole team and organization. We will blame each other for not helping the child, not being able to manage the behavior of the child. And it's very normal in alternative care, and we have to connect that to facing children that experience trauma. Even the people that work with them every day, the foster parents, the SS parents, they can become traumatized themselves just by facing the emotions of children every day. So they need support to understand that and to prevent that they are traumatized themselves or that they burn out. So that's, I'm very happy to hear that, that your ministry is focusing on that. Because without healthy caregivers, we will not have healthy children. And the last step is that we not only work with the children, with their families, with their caregivers, but we also look at the system of providing alternative care, of the educational system. What are the system doing that empowers, that helps children to heal? And what are they doing that is not helping, that is maybe even re-traumatizing the children? So we heard here examples of foster placements or placements in alternative care that break down and children go through several placements. So that's something that is re-traumatizing them. We have to look what is our system doing or what can that, our system do better to prevent placement breakdown. And I believe training our coworkers in being trauma-informed is one of the ways to prevent that. Right? And then, when we want to implement trauma-informed practice, what does it mean? What kind of principles we have to follow? So one of the principles we heard of already from Caspers, if a child was hurt in relationships, it will have to heal through relationships again. So we focus on the nurturing, supportive relationships between a caregiver, being it a social, uh, being it a SOS parent, foster parent, teacher, educator, and the child. How can this relationship be safe and healing? We heard about youth participation, involving children in decisions about themselves, about the way they will, support will be provided to them. And this is a very new thing that is coming also in the trauma healing or in therapy or psychology in general. We start, we are going out of our expert role saying, oh, this is what the client needs from us. We start asking the clients, how is the service I'm providing you helping you or not helping you? And based on that, we are adjusting. Because in the science, we realize that we are learning new things every day. So sometimes we make mistakes, and later we realize something we believed in was wrong. So the best way to navigate is to ask the child or the family we are working with, is this helping to you? Is this supportive, or do you need something else from me? So meaningful youth participation is a key. And we did it in this project. We involved young people. We asked them what they need to be supported, to overcome their trauma. And we had lots of uh, fears. Also, our team, we were discussing, oh, is it too much? Are they going to, you know, are they going to be triggered by talking about their mental health? And we risked it. We did a lot of preventive measures around them to support them. And they were able to talk. They were able to give, up, give us very clear recommendations. And through the two years, they grew so much 
that when we had our closing conference, we heard them speak and we were astonished how reflected they are about what they need, about what does mental health mean to them. So asking young people is a very important point. Another thing that we tend, to, or where we are moving now, it's from deficits, you know? In the past, we were having defectologists, we were focusing on diagnosis, on the deficits of people. Now, we are discovering the power of resources, protective factors. So, we are moving from what is wrong to, with you to what do you need from me to get better? or asking, why are you doing this? Why, why are you, what does it mean? What did you experience so that you are behaving this way or you are feeling this way? So we are moving off from deficits to adaptive model. This is what I meant by understanding behavior of children and the way how they have their relationships as something that, how they adapt it to difficult situations, not how damaged they are or how misbehaving they are. They are adapting. And we have to acknowledge that. Good. And this is just the, you know, just to look at the ecological model so that we have the child in the center and we don't focus only on one level. So we don't blame the caregivers, we don't blame just the parents of the children, we don't blame the schools. All the players, all the people and institutions in the systems, they contribute to the situation. If it goes in the negative direction or if it goes in the positive. So we always put in perspective, also if, if a child was neglected or abused by their parents, we have to think in what kind of situation social situation, economical situation, where the children and how our services supporting, uh, sorry, where the parents and how our services uh, supported that parents to get better and overcome their adversity. Right. So what did we do in this project actually? Um, we did four major things. Um, we focused on our colleagues, on our educators, social workers, caregivers, SOS parents, and we designed a training for them. It was a very extensive training of six days. Two times they had to come for three days and then another three days. In between they have to do a homework so it was a lot of training that we are not usually investing in, like for this long period. And imagine that the training was led by, by trained trainers that introduced the content, but apart from two trainers, we had a third co-trainer in the training, and it was the person with care experience. So a person that grew up in alternative care was there to comment on the solutions, on the reflections of the professionals, and correct at points where we were wrong. So there was also in the evaluation, the power of the training was having the care experienced young people there as a control, telling us, are we going in the right direction? Are we really understanding or not? A part of that, another thing is that, apart from informing all people in our organization about trauma, it's one approach in, uh, in trauma-informed practice. Another one is connecting to other systems, providers, in the ecological model around the child. So the second line of intervention was that we designed online learning modules for judges, for teachers, from, for social workers, from the social welfare centers, for medical professionals. And it's a very basic, they are very basic models about trauma. 
of children in alternative care, explaining very clearly what is their specifics. And then we said it's not enough to equip professionals with new knowledge and tools. We have to enable them to work in this way in the organizations they are working in. So we looked at organizations and analyzed how our organizations can be more trauma-informed so that our practices, our policies, our procedures are supporting children that experience trauma. And then at the end of the project, we put together policy recommendations towards governments, ministries, what they can, how they can contribute to being trauma-informed. So, this is the page of the project. And there is a link to the, to the online learning modules. And there is this first uh, publication that is called Practice Guidance for Practitioners, available to download, as well as the two last publications, Organizational Development for Organizations, and how to work with uh, children that are on the move and with migration background. So you can, you can access them. They are in English and other languages, unfortunately no Latvian. But um, if you speak English, I really recommend you to go and visit e-learning e or look at the practice guidance. I'm not sure if I need to go in, in detail in the e-learning modules, in the training modules. Um, basically, it's all about understanding the impact of trauma, understanding complex trauma, understanding how they influence children, and then what can caregivers do with it? What can professionals do with it? And in the e-learning, we also added the um, the topics of children with migration background or disability, and working with families. In the training of caregivers, we went much more into the deep, much more deeply into the understanding of the impact of trauma. And then we kind of wanted to bridge to, to practice. So the big topic was to explain, to, to create a common understanding uh, how, how we understand in alternative care how to heal trauma. Very often we think we have to send the child to a psychologist or a psychotherapist, that's part of it. But the relationship with the caregiver is even more important than the therapy sessions. So we tried to, sh tried to shift this understanding so that our colleagues see the relationship and everyday care that we provide to children in alternative care as the healing medium. And then around that also add support to the SOS parents, educators, teachers, because they are in everyday contact with the child. So we support them to support the child. And also, there is another offer of therapy, of course, and support that the child needs. But we wanted to focus much more on the relationships. So what are the caring relationships that we want to achieve? And we heard it. Um, there needs to be safety. There needs to be uh, acceptance there needs to be consistency. How do we achieve it? We use very known models like attuned, being attuned to understand what the child, what kind of emotional message and, uh, you know, and the feelings of the child are there when we face a situation with the child, even if this is a situation when it's a crisis situation to understand what is the, 
how the child feels there and addressing that instead of focusing how I feel there and what I want to achieve as, a, as an adult. We talked about core regulation, like the way how mothers soothe their babies. You know, they, they are attuned, they are, they are kind of tuning into the feelings of the child and being there with the child to help them calm down if the child is crying. The same we need to do with older t children, even with teenagers. We have to help them regulate by showing we are okay, by showing how we can deal with emotions, and they will learn from us. So explaining how the brain works, it helps. So what we saw that the brain, the child in a, when they are in stress, children don't think with their thinking brain. They are, we cannot reason, we cannot explain them. It's okay, you are here, everything is safe. But they will not listen to us. They are in their body. So first, we have to regulate them. We have to come close. We have to show through our language, through our body, that we are safe, that they are safe with us. We have to address their emotions. Oh, I see you, see you. you are distressed. I see something is happening. Wow, what's, what's going on? And only after we connect on this level, we can explain. Oh, we can say, you know what happened here? Oh, we have some rules. This is going to be like that or like that, or how can we agree? But these are the steps we start with the regulating, with the emotions, and then we can reason. Very often, we do the absolute opposite. We start saying, stop doing that, it's not allowed. You know, we explain, and then we don't understand why the child is getting more and more upset with us instead of calming down. So these kind of practical things we went through with our colleagues so that they know what to do in practical uh, work. What did we do with the organizations? Well, with the organizations we did basically the same. Looking at what needs to be there to, to support children and young people with experience of trauma. And these are the, the categories that we used. It's based on an assessment checklist that was adapted from Harris and Fellot that work with organizations to be trauma-informed. And the, the publication about trauma-informed organizations has these sections and they are indicators or kind of statements. What does it mean to be safe and promote physical and emotional safety to children? What does it mean to be creating trust between the organization and the child, the caregiver and the child, but also between the caregivers or staff? What does it mean participation and giving choice to children to decide how they want to be supported? What does it mean to cooperate with the child, making decisions together? And what does it mean to empower the child to be, to have self-esteem and to decide about their life. And each organization did go through this checklist and then in a workshop they worked on these topics and in the end came up with an action plan. And they looked how their policies reflect this, these values. So I invite you, if you are curious and interested, I invite your organizations to look at uh, these qualities. Right. And I said that we had young people involved in the project. So one of their outcomes was that they brought messages they wanted to share with professionals in those countries where they live. So I will play just a, one minute of them talking about few of them. I, they will not, I will not show all of it, but let's try. If you can see the English, trans, like also the subtitles on the screen, 
but let's see also how the interpreters will deal with it. I hope it will work. So let's hear from the young people. Right. Amazing. You know, they said it better as me. I was talking for almost an hour, and they, they summarized very well. They, they said what is important. So here are the other messages coming from them. So basically, they say that whatever their behavior is and how they are in relationships when they come to alternative care, it's a result of what they've been through. And instead of punishment that they very often receive, they need support. A lot of the things mentioned here are about love. And we have a difficulty as being professionals at the same time providing love to children. Being a you know, foster parent, maybe it's, not, maybe it's easier, but being a, a teacher or a social worker or a psychologist, how do you make a child feel loved and at the same time keep the professional boundaries? So what the young people say, it's to be authentic and don't be afraid. And really to see that these relationships with the important people, these are the relationships that are deciding how they understand love, relationships, and how they build relationships in the future. And they also say that sometimes we see alternative care as a place where young people should just live and then go out and be independent. But actually, it's the time where they develop and they want to grow also in their mental health. And they also mentioned that the child protection system, education system, don't respect their needs. And sometimes they are hurt by the way we provide support to them or we think we help them. Right. So I think we can take that and reflect on that, each of us as a professional or policymaker or whoever we are. So these were the recommendations from the young people. And as a summary from the project, the recommendations towards policymakers, institutions, organizations, we said we need to acknowledge the impact of trauma on children. And we have to provide stable and caring relationships to support their healing. All children has the right to access mental health services. And we have to look if this right is executed. And if also children in alternative care get the right support they need. We need to support the frontline workers, the SS parents, the foster parents, the educators, to be motivated and safe so that they can be there for children and create these crucial relationships. And that we have to involve young people in designing alternative care provision, finding solutions, finding approaches, because they are the ones that can tell us the most. So, I hope you 
take something from the, from the one hour that we spent together. And if you want to have more, um, you can visit the project page. Thank you. Thank you.